to ABCRA <laughs> annual general meeting, uh, seconded by Linda Chu. All in favor? Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and I'd invite the candidates to come up to the table, please. Is Adam Golding here? Yes, oh, Adam. Okay, great. So we uh, because we didn't know till today you were joining us. I've got a marker. There you go. Uh, we can put you at the end there. Thank you, everyone. All right. So what you guys are going to do is you're going to share the mic okay. for your table. All right. So okay. the four of you will share that mic. Four. Okay. Print and table. that one. Got it. We'll, we'll go there. Thanks. These these mics are left live, so be careful when you snicker. Thank you. <laughs> How's it going? Hey, man, the most close to people in a while. So prior to the evening tonight, we sent all of the candidates a question. Um, and we're going to start the evening tonight by essentially have, having the candidates take three minutes each to introduce themselves and to answer our first question. It's, it is tricky with the number of candidates here to sort of, you know, we, typically what we don't want to do is say, you know, have all candidates answer the same question because we want to see a variety of issues. So what I'll do is I will ask questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand and Catherine will come up to you. Uh, with a note card, and what we'll try to do is we'll try to collate all of the questions and group them together, and then take turns ans asking the candidates different questions. And then maybe if we have time, that some of the candidates could go back at the end and answer questions they would like to answer that they weren't asked the first time around. <laughs> so that's that's your sort of mind power issue: is to remember the questions you want to ask, you want to ask, or issues you want to bring up for sure. And we're going to be ruthless with the timing. John's going to be ruthless. Um, he's very mean. Three <laughs> minutes initially, and then following that, I think, I think we'll do 90 seconds to answer the questions, just to try to get as many people as possible speaking, and to try to give, you know, none of us, you know, we're, I was saying we're lucky at this meeting in some regards that there's no incumbent, so we don't have to talk about what happened in the past. We, you guys can all just tell us, you know, not in generalities, but in specifics, your vision for our city in our neighborhood and how you think we're going to get there. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, Diane Sapp. Sorry? Oh. Uh, maybe. <laughs> First question on my list here, Catherine? The, the question was, what are the three things that affect this area? What would you do about them? Thank you very much, Diane. <laughs> So yes, why don't we start with Diane? We'll start. We'll go from this end to that end, then we'll come back this way. You know, we'll we'll mix it up a bit. Uh, and uh, we're like John said, we'll try. You know, we're all civilized people. Uh, we're going to give everyone a chance to speak. We're going to hear all of their opinions, and we're going to try to get as much discussion happening in the next hour as we possibly can. So Diane, you begin, and we'll move from left to right. Thank you very much. Three minutes beginning now. Hello, everybody. Thank, uh, congratulations on 65 years of ABCRA. That's amazing. You've been doing wonderful work. Thank you for all that you do. My name is Diane Sachs. I'm an environmental and energy lawyer. I was the last environmental commissioner of Ontario. I've got 46 years of experience in government at all levels, business and law. Um, I was born in this ward, and my mother and my children and my grandchildren, I've went to school here, I've worked here, uh, my volunteer work is here, my synagogue is here, my community is here. Um, in terms of the three, the three issues that I was asked to talk about, I have been knocking on doors for most of the last two years, and what I've been hearing from people, the three things that matter the most, first of all is the roads, safety, noise, congestion. Secondly, the decline of the public realm, that we can all see how things are coming apart uh, around us, and thirdly, the lack of affordable housing. Now, there's details about, these are very complicated topics, all of them, as you know. I'm not going to be able to give you a full answer in, in uh, the number of minutes that we have. I'd encourage you to go to my website, votefordiane.ca, and you'll see some of the policy positions there. And on some of these issues, of course, I've also written extensively when I was the environmental commissioner. 
the time I have tonight, I really can only give you one example of the things that I would want to do on each of those. In terms of roads, the single most effective thing we can do to make roads safer and quieter and less congested is to make it easier and safer to get around without a car. And that's road design. Um, it means wider sidewalks that we actually maintain and plow. It means bike lanes. It means uh, speed enforcement. It probably means noise enforcement. Um, Avenue Road is so dangerous. You've seen all the stats, right? So many crashes happen on Avenue Road because it's designed to be dangerous. It's designed to put cars before people. And when we make people before cars, we make it much safer for people to get around without cars. There's more room on the road for those who need to drive. Um, second thing is the decline of the public realm. There's a really simple explanation for this. The city needs another roughly $300 a person a year to be able to pick up the garbage and repair the sidewalks and do all the things that it used to. Do you remember when Toronto used to be New York run by the Swiss? Okay, well we're not anymore, because so much has been downloaded by the provincial government and the city isn't raising the money to do the job. So we need to. The city manager has been telling council how to do this for years. There's a city manager revenue report. One example is the vehicle registration tax that we had in Toronto that Rob Ford and Doug Ford canceled. We should bring it back. Um, lots more detail in the city manager's report. Thirdly, affordable housing that still preserves community. Well, the one central issue is we need clearer, simpler rules. I'm a lawyer. I mean, we're dealing with rules and processes for 46 years. When you have unclear rules, as you just described, you get a disaster, and that's what we've got. We need clearer rules, and one of the things we need is, as of right, missing middle. That's, that's actually... Over three minutes. That's over three Sorry. minutes? Okay. Sorry. All right. Well, I'm just trying to finish that up. Anyway, I didn't have a clock. We need to focus on relentless delivery, and these are the things I will champion at Council. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. I wrote everything down, so I should be on time. So here we go. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Lehman. For the past seven years, I've lived in University Rosedale with my husband, Matt, who's in attendance today. I love my neighborhood and our city. I'm not a career politician, and I believe that's a good thing. I'm a business professional with nearly a decade of experience in people leadership and human resources. I'm a proud first-generation university graduate, holding a bachelor's degree in sociology and criminology, and a graduate certificate in mental health. I'm not running because I need this job. I'm running because I want to make our city a better place for everyone. I'm running because I believe we need a strong voice to stand up to power and in a room full of yes people who don't always have our best interests at heart. Considering my professional experience, educational background, and my courage to speak up when everyone else chooses to remain silent makes me uniquely qualified for this position. Now, going door to door to make sure I stay within, uh, we have a lot to cover here. So safety is one of my number one top priorities. Traffic and poor street design are a contentious issue, particularly as it places constituents in Ward 11 to risk of injury or worse fatalities. I'll focus on safety by considering the following. First, I would establish and roll out a program centered around re-educating motor vehicleists and cyclists on road safety laws. Motor vehicleists need to obey the rules of the road, but so should we as cyclists. No more riding on sidewalks, cycling through stop signs or red lights and going 45 kilometers an hour down busy streets. I would also develop new cycling infrastructure that leverages more of our one-way streets with counterfoil bike lanes. This will help prevent cyclists from riding within a blind spot of a motor vehicle and hopefully save lives. I would implement wider sidewalks and more X-crossing walks to support pedestrian safety and accessibility and deter illegal and unsafe jaywalking. I would decrease speed limits to 30 kilometers an hour where applicable to help prevent fatalities should collisions occur. Next. Um, densification and increased noise pollution is another concern that I would look to address. Development and noise pollution come from the enormous pressures to increase both density and heights of new development in our area. I would work more closely with city planners and developers to influence better and higher quality development in our areas that actually stay within the target date of completion. I would also work to ensure development and construction does not take place outside of permitted hours of operation. No drilling before 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m. We need to respect the, all of our lives and the need for quiet time and get the job done when we say we will. Lastly, lack of green space is what I would also focus on. 
I would work to increase tree canopy from 27% up to 41%. When we lose a tree, plant two more. I would also advocate and negotiate for more public space and parks surrounding new development so that constituents actually have a place to go with their loved ones and for animals. Thank you. 254, well done. <laughs> Norm? Hello everyone, my name is Norm DePasquale. I'm running for City Councilor Ward 11 University Rosedale. Before entering the race for Councilor, I started my advocacy as Chair of No Jets TO. Uh, we fought the uh, paving of the lake and the flying of jets at the island airport. We built a coalition across the city to build a clean green waterfront for all and we won the fight. Then I became a founding member of Ontario Place for All where so far we have managed to save the Cinesphere, the Pods, and Trillium Park. We still have a private spot that we have to work on, but uh, work is ongoing. Then I became an elected school board trustee in University Rosedale, where I pushed issues around equity and um, completed the building of a parkette over at Markham Street and Palmerston Square. So it was school board land and city funding, and we built a new parkette. And it's so popular now it needs upgrading, so there you go. I've seen the state of our city and we need to do better. Services aren't working for residents. Toronto is as unaffordable as ever. Uh, roads are in, uh, not as safe as they need to be and we're still lacking the meaningful climate action that will make us a world leader. There are solutions out there to what is ailing the city and they require someone with the energy and ability to fight for what is right. This is the integral part of my motivation to run in this election. We cannot accept the status quo. This neighborhood has grown a lot and quickly. Because of this, we are seeing strain in a few places. Firstly, on development and affordable housing, it's important to keep residents engaged in the consultation around development um, and make, keep them engaged at a time when they can make changes that work better for the neighborhood. I know that both the ABCRA and the GYRA has done amazing work in this area, securing benefits that help the community now and into the future. And um, it, I appreciate that reasonable perspective that has taken a development. And we have to make sure that um, we continue that work and secure more affordable housing to address the affordable housing crisis in the city. We also need to distribute the density better by doing things like ending exclusionary zoning and allowing softer density through our city. If everyone can absorb a, just a little more density, we don't need to live with tall tower after tall tower. I also want to point out that uh, I am the only candidate I'm aware of who has signed the No Developer Money Pledge this campaign. And I did this because I want residents to be assured that I, I have their best interests at heart as we talk through these developments. Secondly, we have a failure in the city to provide services that meet the needs of residents. From street, street sweeping to snow clearing and parks, washrooms, and general maintenance, the city has failed to appropriately fund and staff these integral services that residents rely on for the public realm. We have to renew efforts to assign the appropriate funding to support these needs. 15 seconds. Thank you. Lastly, it's clear that road safety and infrastructure improvements have fallen behind. We have to create roads that are safe by design. Most of this is caused by 12 years of austerity budgets, and we must have the courage to find new revenue sources to fund the city that we want. My name's Norm, and I hope I can count on your support. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Hi, everybody. My name is Robin Buxton Potts, and I'm running to be your next city councillor. I have over 10 years of experience working at the city. I've worked for four different city councillors, three of whom, uh, no, I guess all four of them have represented a different part of University Rosedale. I've worked for Adam Vaughn and Joe Cressy when they were part of Trinity Spadina. I worked for Kristen Wong Tam when she was your representative. Um, most recently, I was Kristen's chief of staff and was appointed as interim counselor to Toronto Centre in June based on my knowledge, experience, and ability to work collaboratively with council colleagues um, and with civil service. We are losing all three of our downtown councillors in this election. We're losing decades of experience and knowledge at a time when the city is facing some of its highest pressures around transit, around development, construction. Losing that experience is going to have an impact, and voting for me makes sure that there is more continuity. You've heard a lot about the you know, uh, priorities that I think we've all seen. What I have is experience solving a lot of those. On planning and development, I have negotiated thousands of affordable housing units, community benefits, including the largest indigenous um, and entrepreneur and innovation site. I've helped rebuild a dozen parks in this part of the city. Having that, exp the, 
experience to negotiate with those developers is going to be key. We also have to look at things that you've heard about in terms of our revenue. We have a $13 billion state of good repair backlog. So when we have conversations about the fact that our parks are falling apart, that there's graffiti, that snow's not being cleared, that everything is flooding, we want more noise um, reduction. All of these things that we want to build a city that really works for us, we need to be able to pay for. And right now, we do not have a plan to do that. We have options. We heard about one of them, the vehicle registration tax. There's others within the um, City of Toronto Act that we could look at. But we need to have that conversation now in order to really address all of the issues, whether it's transportation, whether it's planning, whether it's climate change, they're all interconnected, but they require a really hard conversation about what we believe in, what we want to pay for, and who we want to build this city for. I've had those conversations. I want to keep having them with you. I want to involve you in every step of that conversation, and I'm hoping I can count on your support. Hi, my name is Pierre Therrien, and I'm a retired authorized nuclear operator. I have the solutions to our problems. I'd like you to think about the climate crisis. Now, imagine a world where humans control climate change, where atmospheric temperature is under control, where glaciers stop melting and the droughts and floods and severe storms return to pre-industrial conditions. Bob Dole pointed out how much CO2 is accumulating in the atmosphere. We discard our commercial waste CO2 there from cars and airplanes. This is what's causing climate change. So here's what I propose. We have now developed CO2 removal technology to the point that we have placed a price on CO2 removal. That price has dropped very low and can be related to the carbon tax. The carbon tax can fund CO2 removal and humans can therefore control climate change. Since we can create any amount of energy and resources we need, the carbon tax can fund removal at any rate so we can remove more CO2 than we emit into the atmosphere. I propose a formula to control climate change where every ton of CO2 polluters discard into the atmosphere. These polluters shall fund the removal of two tons from the atmosphere plus the rebate. I call this 142 plus R. CO2, in the con CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is currently out of control. The curve is going off scale high and this formula will not only turn the curve over but will eliminate all excess CO2 in the atmosphere. I'm calling for a mandate for a financial and technical assessment of this strategy. We will legislate a marketplace for commercial waste CO2 emissions where polluters pay the 142 plus our tax rate into the marketplace, and the marketplace will then fund long-term contracts for bulk CO2 removal. Now, our social fabric, I'd like to discuss that. Conservative ideology has ruined the fabric of our society. Cutting taxes by downloading provincial costs onto municipalities has resulted in roads that are a shambles. 10,000 homeless live on our streets. Conservative populism is the enemy of our society. I'd like to explain why. Politicians have little or no vision to solve our problems, and so I'm here to solve our problems. There is no problem we can't solve by simple redirection of resources. Vote for me for cheap electricity to control climate change and restore the fabric of our society. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Axel Oravisu. Uh, this brings me back to when I was a teenager and I used to play the bass for my local church. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure knowing you. Uh, thank you for showing the interest by being here in your communities, uh, in your community. Uh, I hope uh, I get to talk to each one of you by the end of the night before I go home. Uh, I am here because I care about where I'm gonna raise my children and because like you, I am a stakeholder in what happens in this community. I live, I work, I play in this neighborhood, and I promise you, this neighborhood is my priority. Um, I've been doing work in the community since I was in my early 20s. I founded a non-for-profit organization that uh, helped newcomers get themselves established in, in, in the city. I worked with the Canadian Youth Business Foundation uh, to help young people start their own businesses. Um, 
I've always said I'm not a conservative, I'm not a liberal, I'm not a politician, uh, nor am I chasing down a job because I didn't get elected in the last elections. Um, I am a business-oriented person with a track record, I have the experience, the drive, and the determination to steer the city in the right direction. Um, let me say that my priority uh, is being here for you. Uh, I will always make time to talk, to call back, to write back, to answer any of your questions concerned, but also to do the work. Um, what I see as the three biggest issues uh, facing this neighborhood and Toronto in general are housing affordability, uh, transit and alternative means of transportation, uh, and community and rehabil community rehabilitation and safety. It's a lot to unpack uh, in three minutes, uh, and I will not go into that for uh, time's sake, uh, but I believe I am the person to do the job, uh, and I hope you give me the opportunity to work for you and to work with you as your city councilor. Thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Lovering. I am running to be your city councilor. I live in the ward. I've lived in the ward for about four years. Before that, I lived downtown in Cabbage Town, where I developed quite a understanding of a lot of the downtown issues. In fact, for 20 odd years, I've lived in downtown Toronto. I was born here. And when you knock on every door, or every door, when you knock on doors for months on end and talk to a lot of people, you realize that every door has its own view. Every window has its own view. Every front porch has its own view. And in doing that, you realize, how on earth can I answer each and every one of your issues individually and as, as perfectly as you deserve? And the, the reality is, you can't. We are a community, and we all have to work together. I got into this because I felt, I started my campaign calling it Believe in Toronto. And I felt deep inside that everybody was down on this city. We were down in our communities. And then I decided, OK, well, what can I do about it as a counselor? As one of 26 votes in council, there's lots of things we can all do. We all want environmental. We all want, uh, we all want better transit. And these are all things that are going to come down to a one in 26 vote. But what can I do as a counselor? What can I do as your counselor to answer all of those different points of view? And really, what it is, we start in our front yards. We start in fixing the little things and getting things done. And a counselor does have an ability. I've worked in a counselor's office. The counselor and their staff has the ability to pick up the phone and get things cleaned up and get things done. That's my promise. That's why I'm going to ask for your vote. My name is Peter Lovering. And when it gets down to what my I think are the top three things in this area are, there's certainly development. There's something I call traffic balance, and there's also neighborhoods. I'll talk about neighborhoods a little bit because I think neighborhoods is something that was fought for in the 70s. We went to great lengths to fight for stopping the expressways, which effectively saved and created the Toronto we have today. Without that effort, call it nimbyism if you will, these neighborhoods would not exist. There would have been an expressway going through the beach. There would have been an expressway coming down from the Allen Expressway right outside the front door here. 15 minutes? 15 seconds. <laughs> All I'm saying is that neighborhoods are one of my top priorities, protecting them. And I hope for your vote. My name is Peter Lovering, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to meet you all, everyone. My name is Adam Golding. Sorry for the late registration. I thought I had registered for the event today, but there were two. So I had to, you know, false presupp presuppositions of uniqueness. I was born at Mount Sinai Hospital. My parents met in Toronto. My father died of lung cancer, so I was raised in Barrie, actually by a former Toronto police officer. Who, uh, my grandfather moved on to work at Borden. And my uncle, Neil Herdebees, uh, was shot in the line of duty and survived. So I understand the police situation. That being said, um, I'm part of the Socialist Alliance, and our platform is to defund the police by 50% and redirect those 
resources to our problems differently. Um, the th I'm a software developer and a teacher and a musician, and I'm here to fix the bugs in our, the unfair code that is running our city. If you look at my full platform, it's a list of bug fixes. And the three issues that I think are particular to this riding, please correct me afterwards if I'm wrong, because I'm at Kensington tonight. <laughs> um, street safety. Uh, you know, we need to lower s uh, speed limits, subsidize bikes, and uh, have bike lanes more frequently. Uh, that's related to the climate change issue, which affects the whole city. Um, heritage sites are, uh, are very uh, important here, and that leads to the third issue, which is density. And on the subject of density, I mean, uh, Norm uh, specified the problem, but the NDP often specifies the problem, not the solution. Part of the solution involves reaching across the aisle. And we have to integrate the conservative plan for rent control with the NDP plan for rent control. Conservatives want to scrap rent control and new developments. That makes sense as a building incentive, unless you're demolishing perfectly functional units. So I would adopt an if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it approach to uh, rent control exemptions, and also adopt the NDP's plan to end vacancy decontrol. I realize that we have to push on the province to do that, but um, that's critically important because um, that will stop the bleeding of the evictions crisis. For Toronto as a whole, the, the three issues are kind of different. We, we have a basic needs crisis, including the housing crisis, um, you know, um, and we have a crisis of authoritarianism. Um, the, you know, the hippies were gentrified by force from Yorkville in the 60s, and uh, they raided Rochdale in 1975, where my mother lived, and, uh, you know, we had the bathhouse raids, and uh, we had the G20 in Toronto. And then we had, uh, well, we, we had the, uh, aspects of lockdown. Before that, we had the dispensary raids from Tracy Cook, who needs to be fired. And, um, and then we had the violent mass evictions of the parks in the past summer, and I was one of uh, 30 protesters arrested and charged with obstructing police at Lamport too. My charges were dropped. I was actually reporting the human rights violation that the police were engaged in um, because we had a unanimous vote at city council to take a human rights approach to encampments. We violated our own vote. And um, those legal challenges are still working their way through the courts. You'll probably hear about it in many years. Um, but many people stood up that day. You know, I asked Mike Layton to go down there. He wouldn't do it. I, I phoned 911. They told me human rights violations are not an emergency. Well, they are an emergency. And I'm here to address the emergency of human rights in the city of Toronto. Housing is a human right. We have 26,000 vacancies in Toronto and 10,000 homeless. Ten with seconds. exponential vacancy taxes, doubling the vacancy tax every year, we can solve the problem. It just cuts into developer profits. And Norm, I also took the pledge. No developer money. D Diane didn't. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what we'd like to do next is take some of the uh, questions from you all. Um, a, few, a number of the questions, uh, uh, different folks have asked the same questions different ways. So I'm going to try to uh, uh, consolidate them. Uh, they'll be filtering through me, so forgive me if I didn't quite uh, read them or interpret them the exact way that you intended, but I kind of get the gist of it. Um, we're going to ask two or three of the candidates to answer a question. If someone feels really strongly about it, they can jump in after, but I'd like to get through a number of questions, so we'll randomly pick. If somehow Ian and I are getting this, uh, have somehow uh, frozen someone out of a question or not, then just let us know. This is, again, a cooperative. So um, the question, so far, the issue that's gotten the most uh, attention are um, the issue of, uh, of, of roads, so the use of roadway. Um, for example, uh, congestion that's being caused by the constricting of traffic, uh, potentially also being an environmental issue. So if we're not at a place where we're banning cars yet, people still have cars, and yet the city's bringing in uh, legislation such as condo developers do no longer have to have parking uh, within their buildings. It's no longer a requirement. There used to be a formula for parking in condo developments. Uh, those, unless, those, unless those condo developments are banning cars, those cars are going to park somewhere on your streets, etc. Those cars are still driving. They're idling on Avenue Road or University Avenue and locked in, in uh, traffic jams. That's not environmentally friendly. So how do we get from today to that 2040 scenario uh, in a way that keeps people moving, whether it's public services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how do we address this issue? Because the here and now, we all live the city today. So I'll start with Diane because this is really one of her issues, and I'll go from there. Thank you. There's lots of research on what works on roads. Uh, the simplest way to think about it is how many people can fit through a given space. The amount of road space we have is fixed. The number of people is increasing. Anybody who's in a car is taking up 
quite a bit of space. A person who's walking takes much less space. A person on a bus or on a bicycle takes a tiny amount of space. So given that we have a lot more people to put through any given amount of space, anyone who's walking is leaving more room for everybody else. Anyone who's on a bus or on a bicycle is leaving more room for everybody else. And that also reduces noise, and it also reduces cost for the city. So we've got examples all around the world. Paris is a fabulous example. In the last three years, they've completely transformed the quality of life in the city by putting walking and biking first. They've got just as many people getting here and there, but they've got far fewer cars. So given that the city is in a tremendous financial crisis and that we also have a, tr a problem with safety and with noise and with congestion, continuing to prioritize the car doesn't solve any of those problems and will lock us in gridlock. The only way forward is to, t is to follow the examples and the research everywhere else to get as many people as possible out of the personal cars. And that's what Transform TO calls for. 75% of local trips under five kilometers should not require a personal car. It'll be on um, per walking, biking, transit, anything like that. And we can do that, and it'll save the city money, and it'll clean the air and reduce noise and improve health, and far fewer people will die in crashes. We can do it. We need to do it. Thank you, Diane. I'm going to go to Axel. Uh, yesterday, my wife uh, was uh, commuting, com commuting from work to home. We, we live not too far away from here. And uh, it literally uh, took her uh, longer to get on the bus and uh, get home than it would have taken her to walk home. Uh, congestion is a real issue. Uh, I, I think the answer is investing in, uh, in, in transit, transit uh, infrastructure, uh, continuing with the expansion of it. Uh, increasing tr transit service, uh, push for amalgamation of uh, uh, via rail, metro links, and the TTC. Uh, and I wanna, uh, I really wanna push uh, for the expansion of the expansion of bike lanes, uh, but using better design principles that respond to cycling needs of the city, uh, and create infrastructure that's uh, high in quality, uh, that is safe, but it creates. Uh, the foundation for systemic and lasting changes that encouraging that encourage a culture of cycling. Thank you, Peter. Right beside there, maybe. Peter, do you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I saw your. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to go? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, what I would like to do, uh, I would call the situation in Toronto the gridlock and the pedestrian safety. I'd call it pathetic, and uh, I would say that uh, I would say that Diane's comments about. Uh, of using uh, Paris as an example are awesome, but we need to go much further. We need, uh, I, I would say that by your 2040 vision, I would say that Toronto requires an underground expressway network. I would propose a hundred billion dollars for new tunnels. I would propose, uh, I would propose we do an Elon Musk style tunneling expedition under this city. I think we need to spend another $100 million on vast improvements to our subway system. And I think that, uh, and I think that uh, in addition, the, uh, the pedestrian safety, as Diane mentioned. Thanks, Pierre. P Peter had his hand as well, and then Adam, and then we'll go to a next question. How's that? Uh, oh, Andrew, thank, oh. thank you. A lot, of, a lot of what I've been talking about the door at the door uh, has been about something called road balance. Uh, we all have to get around. Yes, we need to invest in transit. But we also have to be careful about throwing bike lanes into arterial traffic without proper foresight or without proper education of the public. I hear from a lot of seniors who are terrified. The most terrifying part of their day is crossing the road because of the mayhem that is coming up and down both directions on one side of the street, not just from cars, but from e-scooters and those sorts of things. So when I talk about traffic and when I look at traffic, we might not have bike lanes on every arterial road, but we will have more bike lanes. And that's what I strive for is more bike lanes but we have to have a sensible approach to road balance, and that's how I see that. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I think we'll have everyone do this question. So, Adam, oh yeah, just well, yeah. really quick remark. I just wanted to frame the uh, idea of increasing speed limits near homes as an implicit carbon tax. 
because it makes it sort of uh, that the carbon uh, expending drivers have less of a speed advantage on bikes. So a lot of people just compare trip times on Google. And if you change speed limits, that's going to switch people to using bikes a lot of times just because the difference in trip times won't be as big. So I just wanted to add that footnote. that Think of the speed limit downtown in being increased as an implicit carbon tax. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Robin? Um, yeah, thank you. I don't disagree with anything that Diane said. What I will say is that I've actually done that work. Um, I was part of the team that built the Bloor bike lane pilot. And I spent two years talking to residents and businesses as that bike lane was going in to understand what their concerns were, to understand on a block by block basis where the turn radiuses were, where could people stop, how do we make sure that the people that live around there are still able to get through that arterial road. And what happened was that the residents of the businesses are now its biggest defender. They've seen their um, business uh, revenues go up. Residents are more engaged in their local community. That is an important way of building this. We need to do it faster, but we need to do it in consultation with the people that currently live there. It is an accessibility issue if people can't get around. The 75% of trips under uh, five kilometers that Diane mentioned that is for the people that live in the direct area so that they can leave the city, so that people who require a car to get to their doctor's appointment can get there. We need to make that possible, but we can't do it without infrastructure in our transit, in bike lanes, and walking. It is going to be painful to make that transition. I'm not going to pretend that it won't be, but having conversations with residents to understand what those specific pieces are while we make that transition um, is a commitment that I continue uh, t I will make and I continue to make and it's something that I have done um, exceedingly successfully in the past. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. No Norm and then Andrew. Yeah. Thank Thanks for the question. So we're building house housing by transit and I guess with the hope that people will ride a TTC, but the TTC has to be reliable. It currently is not as reliable as it needs to be. So we, we need to fund it so that it is reliable. Um, the other thing, you know, we're building it near bike lanes, but if people don't feel safe in those lanes, if those lanes aren't fully protected, people won't cycle. If they don't feel safe on our sidewalks, they might not walk. So, you know, putting on my school board trustee hat, I asked parents, why did you drive to school today? And they said, I drive because I didn't feel safe to walk. So this is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, with respect to that goal of 75% of people walking and biking under five kilometers, I really try to focus on schools there. So parents are driving because they don't feel safe. And the current funding at the city, it will take 75 years to apply safety interventions to all of our schools. We need to increase that funding so that families feel safe to walk and bike to school. And then I hope the parents will feel safe to cycle to work after that. And this will help us to take some cars off of the road. Um, construction management for sure needs to be better. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it in the neighborhood and we need to focus on that. And um, I'm stunned to hear from somebody tonight that an entire level of parking got deleted from a condo development because people are being told, hey, you know what, you can just park in a side street. You don't need to spend the $30,000 on that parking spot. Um, you know, this, this needs to be, yeah, plus, probably plus plus from that, what I just quoted. But uh, this needs to be looked at. And, um, you know, do we need to prioritize street parking um, for those who live on the street? Thanks. And do we need to stop developers from telling people that message? Because we have Thanks, limited street parking too. Thanks, Norm. Thank you. Thank you. Just this to clear has no money. Sure. How the heck are we supposed to fund these improvements to the pedestrian? How are we supposed to... Pierre, can we uh, pause while we just wait for Andrew to come and then we can go next? Uh, just to clarify, the city passed... It's not a condo development. The city passed legislation removing all requirements of developers to provide parking in-house. Yes. So just to be clear... Um, uh, go ahead, Andrew. All right, thank you so much. Like I said at the beginning, I think we actually have to revisit and roll out a road safety plan. I think there's a big lack of respect between motor vehicleists, cyclists, and pedestrians. We need to find ways to actually make sure that we use these spaces safely, and that starts with re-educating everyone so that we can have some respect and be safe. I also think that we need to revisit our traffic light cadence to help improve positive traffic flow. Our lights are really, really frustrating right now. You, you make it to a green light and then you're stopped at a red again. It doesn't allow you to have positive traffic flow. We need to revisit that. I also think, you know, we always, there's a lot of hate around motor, people who drive cars or motor vehicles. That's what brings in a lot of, you know, that's what helped build our cities. So, I, you know, I do think that we could encourage more active transportation. 
I'm a cyclist year round, but not a lot of folks feel comfortable or safe using, you know, their, their bikes or uh, throughout the winter months, which is three quarters of our, our season and our year. So I think, you know, when we do invest in bike lanes, we need to really explore the option of leveraging a lot of our one-way streets in Ward 11. We have so many of them. Let's use counterflow bike lanes so that we can go against traffic and see each other so it, it helps improve the safety. You're not driving in a, you know, a car's blind spot. Um, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, there, by the way, there was a, I'm not going to ask the question of the, uh, of the, um, um, uh, of the uh, candidates, but there were two questions relating to those who did or did not live in our ward. Ian and I don't think it's that critically important, but the issue has been raised by a few people, just FYI. Uh, Paul, question from Jara. Thanks, John. I'm Paul Bedford, uh, one of the uh, board members of the Greater Yorkville Residents Association. Uh, and we represent about 10,000 people living in all of the uh, condo high-rises in this neighborhood. And we're a vital part of this and work closely with ABC. I, I just have a couple of basic questions. If you, anybody's looked at the Star and the Globe today, great articles in there about quality of life. And it starts off in saying, Toronto is planning to deteriorate. It's right there in black and white. It's been referred to in the panel. And I think there's really, really key issues in this ward and the entire city about our future quality of life for existing residents and future residents. And it's got three subs to it. One is public realm, the maintenance and improvement and investment in public realm, which we've heard from various candidates is not very successful right now. Second, and it's the biggest question, is money. We don't have any. The city is now a billion dollars short in this current operating budget. It's slated to fall behind by 13 billion, the state of good repair. The question there is, where the hell are we gonna get, as a council and a mayor, the funds needed to improve this city and to maintain what we have and grow this in the future. And I'm gonna put out three possibilities and I'd love to hear the commentary here. One is road tolls, you've heard that in the past. A third is a share of the sales tax and a third is the share of the income tax. Toronto generates enormous amounts of money that go to the province and the federal government. Toronto keeps eight cents only out of every dollar to fund all our services in this city. That's gotta change or we're in big, big trouble in the future. And the last is political will. How are you as a council, councillor and a council as a whole gonna have these things implemented so we can actually move forward? Thank you. Uh, Robin, why don't you start that question? It's such an easy one, why don't you go for it? I mean, it sort of is an easy one in that um, everything that Paul just said is true. Our finances are in really dire shape. So we have to have a serious conversation about what we want to do here. The other piece is what the city of Toronto is actually able to do versus what we need permission from the province to do. So there are a number of things that we can do to raise revenues that are not property tax um, only. We can diversify that revenue tool. So a few have been mentioned, including the vehicle registration tax, uh, a parking tax, an entertainment tax. These are things that, as we use the things in our city, that we're gonna have to pay a little bit more for. But then tying those specific new revenue tools to outcomes so that we can actually see the impact of them. So if we're gonna have a parking levy in the downtown core, making sure that people can look on the budget and say, oh, the money that I spent there has raised this much money and it went to fix all of these, you know, this street. There are other things that we can do. This past summer, um, on Parliament Street, uh, I worked with the Cabbage Town BIA and two of the developers to create something called the Cabbage Town Parkscape. And if you didn't get a chance to see it, for two blocks on Parliament, we implemented these giant green spaces that had live trees and a sandbox and all of these incredible spaces where people and kids and everyone just hung out on the street and we improved that public realm. Sure, it was just a temporary installation, but it was done in a creative way with the business Thank community. Thank you, Robin. That's great. Pierre, I think, wanted to go, and then... Um, 
Adam and then Peter. Yeah. Canada is the strongest country financially in the G7. We have oodles of money to spend. Trudeau has already asked the public what our, what our shopping list might be. I can't believe that John Tory is not asking for help to get us out of this financial crisis, this, this homeless crisis. This city has suffered incredibly as a result of this pandemic. And just as we took the, the debt we took on in stride to get through COVID, we can spend money that will, money that we take on as debt that increases our productivity this, this, results in, this results in us thriving. This suppresses inflation. And so spending more money is a good thing. But this city needs a, this need, city needs a, a dollop of money that will, will straighten out these situations with uh, homelessness especially. I, I advocate we need $100, 000, $100 million dollars immediately before Christmas to establish 4,000 beds. Before the snow flies, we can produce 4,000 new temporary beds, and I advocate for 1,000 permanent beds as well. We have a few hundred beds here in Toronto with 10,000 homeless. They can't lift themselves up out of this. How are they supposed to get a job when you don't even have an address? Thank, thank, thank you, Pierre. Adam, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, of the options mentioned, I'm pretty partial to the income a portion of the income tax, especially for paying for transit. I've said a lot that transit should be free at the point of use for climate reasons, privacy reasons, class reasons. Putting on the income tax makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I mentioned earlier an aggressive exponential vacancy tax. To my knowledge, I'm the only candidate proposing this in any ward or even in the mayoral races. It's what we need. Um, we have uh, 26,000 vacancies and 10,000 homeless. An exponential vacancy tax could pay for some of uh, the additional costs mentioned. Uh, I sense this might not be a defund the police crowd, and a lot of those costs will be redirected into other emergency services, and we should measure response time for, for funding results there, but th that is a revenue source, because uh, we are spending a lot on authoritarianism, as I mentioned earlier. I predict the price tag will turn out to be above $100 million for the encampment evictions last summer. It's already in the tens of billions, and new costs keep being revealed, like, oh, they were surveilling people for months, et cetera. I also want to mention, we've proposed, um, well, we've, we've heard proposals in the Socialist Alliance. We have a monthly convention about policy every month. Uh, that's redundant. <laughs> uh, a progressive tax on additional properties. So um, we are proposing a not increasing property taxes on primary residences, unlike some uh, leftist or groups. Um, which has dinged us on the questionnaires, but uh, it should be only, you know, your second, third, fourth home, those property taxes should be more, and it should be increased with each property, probably. We haven't uh, formally passed that policy yet. We have just something similar, a 30% tax on your additional property, something like that. But I like the progressive idea. Thanks, and, and just, yeah, the exponential vacancy tax is the core idea I want to communicate here. Thanks, Adam. I think uh, Peter wanted to go as well. And Yes, uh, once again... I think there's a variety of levers that can be pulled, and they are one of, I have, any one of us as representative, representatives of yours has a one in 26 vote to get that passed and make it happen. I'm sorry? Speak up louder. Oh. We have one in 26 vote as your representative as city councilor, whichever one of us it is. So what it comes back down to what can we do immediately? What can any councillor do immediately? And it is finding efficiencies. I have said from the outset on all of my literature, it's about a cleaner, safer, more efficient city. Efficiencies trickles up into services. The councillor is supposed to hold city services available. And I guarantee you can just think to yourself about one city service you think could be more efficient. If you can do that, then that's what I'm talking about, is that there is efficiencies to be found. It could be 10%. And that's not going to cost us more money, but it's going to get us immediate results. That's what I would like to see. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to actually continue with that question. I will add a footnote to Peter's comment because it came up, which is the, the, di the this debate has been framed as status quo in the malaise or raise revenue, raise property taxes, but there is a school of thought that maybe the city isn't uh, functioning all, all cylinders at the moment. Certainly it's been some of our experience in trying to get city staff to come out. So 
we can just add that in. No, up here, you've already had a shot. Just Let's a let. Comment about let, what you said. There, there is another way. There is another way to obtain funding for this city. The the transit fees are a tax on the poor. The carbon tax is a tax on the rich. Let's let the rich pay for transit. The carbon tax can fund transit operations. Transit can be free in this city in five years. So there that that would be ways. that would be the capturing that from the federal government. So that whoever made the point earlier about John Tory, uh, Axel, if you don't mind, we'll come back to you. We'll go to Diane first, and then come back to you on this. Thank you. Hi. Let's go back to your question. I mean, you asked three things, three examples, the road tolls, sales tax, and income tax. All of those were in the city revenue report that I mentioned. The city manager made a very detailed report to council in 2017. I recommend it to you. It's all still true. Uh, all three of those are significant and important, and none of them can be done without the permission of our current premier. And, um, well, he, he does not have our best interests at heart. So the first question is, what can the city actually do under the City of Toronto Act, which doesn't, unfortunately, include things like a carbon tax? There are some things the city can do, but they don't raise very large amounts of money. Um, we're going to need to do both. We need to do the things we can do, which include parking levies and uh, registration fees and stormwater fees uh, and maybe some increases in property tax. That Those are all things the city... Excuse me, I'm that talking. Is, yeah. Excuse me, I'm Pierre, talking. Pierre, please stop interrupting. Thanks, Pierre. Thank you. Those Go are ahead, all Diane. things that the city can do and needs to do, and it won't be enough. We do need the permission of our overlord at Queen's Park to raise significant amounts of money. And I agree that the income tax is the best because that means that people who make the most money are contributing the most. Will we get that from this premier? It's worth asking, but we then can't just sit on our hands and do nothing if he says no. Thanks. And that's Thank why we have to go back to putting our own big boy pants on. Thanks, Diane. Thank you. I, I would ask that we don't interrupt one another when we're speaking. Uh, Axel, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to be short, sure, fully support the idea of uh, road tolls uh, and requesting more from the provincial and the feds, uh, they, which they just announced that they have big surplus, both of them. Uh, a lot of that money should come back to the city uh, since we're the largest generator of uh, 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 monies from for both of them. Uh, but then also doing stuff like um, uh, fixing managing uh, management inefficiencies, um, opening up the books uh, and having, having a transparent uh, bookkeeping with the city of Toronto, uh, being a home builder and dealing with uh, the building department. You can see uh, that there's a large amount of not only management, uh, management inefficiencies, but corruption in within the, the city of Toronto. Uh, I, I'm of the idea of opening the finances and opening the, the accounting books and, and see where those contracts go, who's, uh, who's friends with whom, and, uh, and uh, you know, follow the money. Thank you, Axel. I think Andrew and then Robin, and that's, that'll be that yep. question. Oh, Me sorry, and, Norm. and Norm, I apologize, Norm. Yep. Yeah, yep. I would say, you know, in terms of, I think we absolutely need to look at efficiencies here. I think in terms of road tools, I would not support that. You know, people who are priced out of the city and who want to come to the city would be the ones who are most impacted by these road tolls. It may be a small dollar value, but it's enough to potentially deter people from actually coming in and, and you know, contributing to our, our, our city. I would support share of sales tax and share of income tax. Um, and again, we'd have to influence the premier here. But I really think the most important thing is actually, you know, looking at our budget. Does it make sense? We need to stay close to it. We can't just have a quarterly report, look at it, and then move away. We have to make sure that we're actually making sure we stay within the budget. We can't keep thre threatening constituents when we fail to get it right. Thank, thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, Norman, uh, Robin, and then Norm. Uh, that'd be great. Thank you. On the issue of efficiencies, I would ask everyone to think about um, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the city has spent looking for those efficiencies. For the last 15 years, every year, the mayor has said we're going, regardless of the mayor it's been, that we're going to find those efficiencies. And we have found them. We found them in things like our libraries. We found them in things like our parks. We found them in things like picking up garbage. We found them in things like snow removal. These are all of the things that we're now turning around and saying, why, why doesn't our city look better? Why doesn't it work better? And it's because we found those efficiencies. 
that doesn't mean that things are working perfectly. One of the challenges of the um, 25 ward system is that we're all responsible for a much bigger part of the city. So it's harder to go and make sure that staff are accountable for the work that they're doing and doing those kinds of site visits that um, I definitely used to do when I was a staffer in Trinity Spadina. That's the kind of work that I want to commit to continuing to do, to hold the staff that we do have accountable to help build trust with residents that the work that we say that we're going to do, we're going to do and we're gonna do it well. We won't just accept when staff tell a counselor's office that things have been fixed. We'll actually go out and make sure that it has been. That is efficient, maybe not, but it is helping and build trust while we also say, here's what we need to do more. Robin, Norm. Thank you. With respect to revenue sources, I want revenue sources that help us meet our goals. So we're in an affordable housing crisis, so let's have a vacant home tax. I think, you know, housing that's sitting idle, it should be, somebody should be in that housing. It's as simple as that. Um, then I support things like parking levies, the vehicle registration tax. We might even be able to double check that your sticker's up to date and, you, you know, other parking fines are paid. Um, I, I hear some folks are running around with old stickers out there. Um, and then with respect to the outdoor realm, um, you know, people are relying on our outdoors more than ever, um, you know, in this pandemic. So they expect washrooms that work and fountains that function. So we should be monitoring these closely. And I think even monitoring them publicly to make sure that they are up and running. And if they're not, when are they going to be fixed? Um, we need to restore trust in our outdoor spaces. And um, with respect to pub public realm, I would love to see something maybe where some more local governance of parks is put into place so that, you know, the people who enjoy the parks can be part of kind of maintaining them and making sure that everything is up to date and, and functioning the way they expect. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. So um, it's 8.30, and I'd like to propose that we go another 15 minutes, if that's okay with everyone. We're having a good discussion. We have to follow up that question with regard to which other candidates live in the ward. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, if you can go start with Diane, go down. Do you live? Yes, no. Live in the ward. I don't sleep in the ward. I don't sleep in the ward, but my whole community is here. I, and as I said, I was born here, work here, went to school here. My family is here. My my whole community is here. Thanks, Dan. Go ahead, Andrew. Yep, I absolutely live in this ward. I've lived here for the past seven years, like I said, with my husband. Um, this ward is personal for me. Uh, you know, I really want to make sure, as city councilor, I have to look you in the eye and make sure I did a good job. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. I just I live just south of the ward. As a renovated renter, I unfortunately wasn't available to I wasn't able to find an affordable place for my family to live in Ward 11 when I was searching, and I was lucky to find something that actually worked in the midst of this affordable housing crisis. Um, this is a reality for many people faced with eviction due to rising rents or other reasons. However, just because I live outside the boundaries doesn't mean I don't understand the challenges that we're facing. And Thank a boundary you. on Dundas Street doesn't mean the challenges we face as a city changes. Thanks, Norm. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I do not either. I live in cooperative affordable housing at Broadview and Mortimer, so I look over the valley um, and look at the ward. I spend a lot of time in that valley. It's personal to me. My family did grow up here, but mostly the work that I have done at the city has been in this neighborhood. Thank you, Robin. Here. Hi. I was, uh, I was born in Sarnia, and I spent most of my life on the outskirts of Toronto watching, watching politics in Toronto and Ontario. And I've come here to the centre of what I see as our society. And Ward, Ward 11, that's what it is. It's, uh, it's, it's Kensington Market, it's Queen's Pierre, Park, Pierre, the Annex. Pierre, do you live in the ward? Sorry, that's the question if you live in the ward. Yeah, I don't live in the ward, okay. and, uh, but I have come here from the outskirts Thank because you. I have some solutions to our problems. Uh, Axel, thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Not only do I live in the world, I work in the world and I play here. Uh, and I also, uh, I started a business, uh, I've run a business for almost 20 years that started in Kensington Market and I am a home builder. I built seven uh, laneway houses in the past uh, year uh, just around the neighborhood. Thank you. I too live in the ward. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I've lived here for, <laughs> yeah, right? That's the parachutes table if you swap Andrew and Pierre. I've lived for 20 years because I wanted to run here, and I just want to mention that um, parachutes might not be a huge issue, but we're talking about establishment parachutes. Uh, vote for an independent who doesn't take marching orders from the Green Party, the NDP, or the Liberals. Thank you, Adam. So I would like, the next question is to do with our secondary plan and some pretty complex development issues. I want to frame it for a moment. And I want to frame it by saying, and again, I'm, I'm going to, this is, I'm giving you the Coles notes. But the uh, city, with the consent of the province, brought in something called inclusionary zoning about 
a year and a half or so ago. I can't remember the exact date. It's all a blur. And essentially that mandated uh, the city to um, require that developers have something between 5 and 10% of all new developments uh, have to have uh, an afford, for lack of a better term, an affordable housing, housing component in every new building. So in theory, in principle, that sounds like what a wonderful idea. It's inclusionary. Uh, the problem is uh, twofold. One, the, uh, rather than implement it with like a, you know, a start date next week, they gave everyone about a year and a half to um, put in a tsunami of development applications so they could avoid this legislation. And so this tsunami of development proposals that we've seen in the last 18 months is for that reason primarily. Every single little lot, little grocery store, what have you, that has a development proposal on it is because a development lawyer went to the property owner and said, inclusionary zoning is coming, it's gonna take away value from you, get your application in now. That's the Coles note version, obviously it's more complex than that. The second problem with it, and then we'll turn this to a question, is that it's non-discriminatory in terms of value. Now this is, may sound like nimbyism, but a development in this neighborhood sells for $2,000 a foot, a new development. Now no one is under the illusion that we're gonna get ourselves out of a housing crisis by building more $2,000 a foot condos. Whereas in other parts of the cities, in very nice parts of the cities, you can still buy at 900, 1,000, 1,200 a foot. So the question put, uh, the part one of the question is, why are we not uh, taxing the $2,000 uh, a foot condo on the, on the basis of a 10% of that would go to inclusionary housing and then using that to get double the amount of housing in other neighborhoods where, where these developments are $1,000 a foot. Again, we're not talking about creating ghettos. We're talking about other perfectly great neighborhoods in the Danforth, et cetera. So there's, a, there's this two-pronged, skewering uh, in the marketplace uh, of, of this serious issue that's being created by the marketplace. Lastly, the, you know, the, the rumor from Queen's Park is that once this election is out of the way, the province actually is gonna take back that power regardless. Who knows, it's a rumor, some, of, you know, some folks can comment on it. So this is a segue into our secondary plan and the importance of our secondary plan. And you know, uh, what, what do you think are the most important policy areas that need to be included in a secondary plan with a view to creating stable housing for existing people who live here, but also inclusionary housing going forward? So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a complex, it's a bit of a stew, but there's a lot there. I'll start with Norm. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate the stew. Um, so I support inclusionary zoning. Um, it, it does sit on um, the Ontario government's desk and we should pressure the Ontario government to sign inclusionary zoning into law. Um, you know, a benefit of having inclusionary zoning in every single development is that we end up with more mixed income housing, which I, I think is healthy for a neighborhood. Um, but, um, you know, um, that was a novel idea that was proposed, which I think should be taken back and considered. So thank you for that. Um, inclusionary zoning has been successful in other places across North America, so there is a, a track record out there and a proven model. Um, and with regards to the secondary plan, um, it, I recognize this plan has been scheduled to be completed for an exceptionally long time. Um, we can't continue to, you know, planning can't continue to, to delay their findings, as this will have an important impact on the future growth of this area. Um, we need an immediate update from staff and clear next steps for future involvement and then finally completion. So it's a priority for me to see this plan improved um, in line with resident expectations as quickly as possible. Thank you, Norm. Thank you. Robin, do you want to go next? Thank you. Sure. Um, secondary plans are a really great tool to help uh, make planning in a neighborhood easier. One of the things that it does by creating very clear rules like we heard earlier, it makes the development process easier. It lets people know exactly what's expected of them. Um, and it helps us create spaces like mid-rise housing. So if you own a, a single family home somewhere, um, it is possible to um, add a secondary suite to it. Something like that that doesn't require a whole rezoning as it would right now. Inclusionary zoning is one tool that we've looked at for uh, building affordable housing, and I do think that it has worked other places, and there's no reason to assume that it won't work here. But it is also within the context of a planning um, uh, scenario that's changing. 
the section 37 and section 45, which are the community benefits that have been negotiated with developers by city councilors for the last number of years, that is changing. There is now a 4% flat rate benefit that's coming to us. So how we use that money, which in the past has gone to affordable housing or public realm or streetscape improvements, now we only have 4% to go to one thing. So our whole scenario on the planning um, act and how we work with developers is changing. And having experience doing those negotiations, understanding community priorities, is going to be critical to make sure that we're getting the best out of every development, whether they're using inclusionary zoning or not. Thank you, Robin. Uh, maybe we go to Andrew, Diane, and then we go to the other end of the table. Thank you. Yeah, so I would support inclusionary zoning as well. I think one of the biggest concerns that's driving up, you know, the sky-high property values in the last 20 years is the lack of coherent rules in the form of zoning. So right now, you know, basically developers can pay whatever they want, and then they put excessive demands on, on us to make sure that, you know, we, we help fund and, and support that. And that drives the cost of affordable housing up in the city. Um, so I would support inclusionary zoning and actually having rules in place that, you know, help monitor and level out what developers are paying because that's driving up the market. Thank you, Andrew. Diane, would you like to uh, comment on this? Thank you. Sorry, masks and hearing aids is a bad combination. Thank you. Um, the 18-month rule was a, clearly a bad idea. I mean, it was totally foreseeable that there would be the gold rush that you're talking about. And it's uh, one of the, I mean, again, the province created this, the city can't change it. But what we could be looking at is having development approvals expire. Because this is one of the problems that we have now, is you get an approval out of an, under an outdated system of rules, but then it's like a zombie. It continues to exist for a long period of time, and it makes it harder to get to the new rules. So that would be one thing that would be helpful. To get back to your actual question, which was about the secondary plan, which I don't think anybody's talked about yet, I, I do think that quality of life is going to be really important. We have this push by the province to have intensification and to have it by transit, and there's a reason for that. But what's com being completely lost in that is the quality of life issues, the public realms issues, which the province is constantly cutting back. And the, the cutting of 40% uh, cut in financing that Robin mentioned, that's one piece of it. This uh, pressure in the small, strong mayor powers to make the mayor bully council and to make things easier for developers, that's going to make it harder. So we really need to have a relentless focus on delivery of what makes public realm better. And part of that is building new things like the Yorkville Park extension that you helped work on. And part of it is maintaining and looking after what we have. Thank and relying on volunteers isn't going to do it. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you for that, too. Thank you, Diane. If Adam would be great. Yeah, you're right about the onset time for inclusionary zoning. I watched all of those deputations, quite passionate pleas from people in the city about the real emergency we're facing, and then I heard the time frame after they passed it, and I laughed because I thought it was a sick joke. And the same thing is true of the vacancy taxes coming on too slowly. We declared a state of emergency, but not about housing. And we recently declared the state of emergency over. Can you believe it? And well, people are still dying. Um, and the notion of a, a plan, um, I just want to say it often frames things in the wrong time scale. We need action on a much shorter time scale than we associate with the word plan. Doing something tomorrow is not what people mean when they say plan. Doing something this week is not what people mean when they say plan. We need to de redeclare the state of emergency, and the plans will come later. We need to act tomorrow. Great, thank you. Peter, do you want to uh, comment on this? Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I think city planning is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, I think there hasn't been any planning. And we've seen it in this neighborhood, and we said the secondary plan is, is a decade ago. And quite frankly, that sounds like an efficiency to me. And that's the kind of thing I've been talking about. Thank you. Axel? Uh, yeah, 100% believe in uh, inclusionary zoning. Uh, plus, uh, we, we should definitely leave a higher tax on uh, that $4 million house uh, that we could then put towards uh, affordable housing. Um, and we should force developers to uh, build communities and uh, not just buildings. Thank you. Uh, Pierre, do you want to quickly? Thank you. Sure, I'll be short. I hate to let everybody down here, but uh, it, it appears to me that uh, real estate valuations are dropping, dropping rapidly. And uh, we stand before a financial crisis that will 
that will bring real estate values down to the minimum. And without, uh, without massive investment from the federal government over the next few months, it's my opinion that uh, the condo construction industry will collapse. And uh, through this period, I see the uh, I see the city councilor as being a, the city council as being in an excellent position to dictate terms to the developers and tell them minimum sizes, minimum amounts of public space with the, will go with these developments. That's what I have to say about that. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Okay, so uh, one uh, kind of unusual question, well, not unusual, uh, I'll ask everyone this question. Raise your hand if you oppose banning leaf blowers. There was a question. Two people have asked that question. So if you, if you support leaf, if you're supporting leaf blowers, you're raising your hand. So. Yeah, so gas powered. I'm sorry, gas powered. So does anyone not want gas? Am I wording this correctly? Is anyone? <laughs> yes. Who wants gas powered leaf blowers to stay? Anyone? No one. Okay, great. Okay, so what? To, oh, yeah, you want? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Decimal regulations, uh, perfect. So we're going to wrap up with um, one minute each, but uh, before we do that, um, there are a whole other, ton of other questions, so I'm just going to read some of them so that you all and the candidates know what, you know, what people are thinking. Uh, maybe you can incorporate that into your one-minute summation. Um, uh, so secondary plan, we touched on road safety, very important issue. We've touched that on, on that. Affordable housing and homelessness, we touched on that. Questions relating to that. Uh, the tree canopy, uh, it's in some areas it's under threat, so very important. Uh, we've actually had a number of battles here with the city to protect trees, believe it or not, how that is even possible that someone wants to cut a big tree down. Um, how to improve the committee of adjustment process. We spend an inordinate amount of time at committee of adjustment, and quite a few of us believe committees of adjustment now is deep into the overreach territory. Um, um, quality of life issues as it relates to condo, street racing, public safety, street noise, uh, you know, Lamborghinis and motorcycles, those kinds of things. We talked about uh, maintenance of city streets and parks. Uh, a big issue going forward, but only up to a point, because as Norm's noted, or uh, Robin noted, uh, Section 37 is no longer going to be around, but there is a big pot of Section 37 somewhere in our ward. Uh, whoever the future councillor is, we're going to be sitting down with them and make sure it's properly allocated as we had anticipated. Um, so why don't we start with uh, Adam and come back this way. We'll do just one minute summation and then we would welcome everyone to stay, coffee, sandwiches, etc. And we can discuss informally with whomever. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, pleasure to see you all. Come out tomorrow to Bampot where I'll play piano and chat with residents every week. Um, there's a question I skipped earlier, actually, about political will, and I wanted to mention that the solution to the political will problem is to form a team, and that's what we've done. I heard all year during lockdown, uh, leftists saying there's something wrong with the NDP, there's something wrong with the Green Party, we need something new. Well, we have something new now. It's called the socialistalliance.ca, and uh, that is how we address the problem with political will. Um, on things like, uh, you know, like noisy street racing, I mentioned just a second ago, we need decibel-specific regulations rather than regulating content, you know, because I've seen people who only complain about music if they don't like the music. It's, musicians should be allowed to be as loud as, uh, as uh, city trucks, because uh, it's the same decibel level. <laughs> Um, at any rate, um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I want to really emphasize the need for exponential vacancy taxes. It's the most important thing I can say today. It's the most important thing we can do. Um, why does no one propose exponential vacancy taxes? Well, half of them haven't thought about the math too hard, and fair enough, they're thinking about other things, and half of them have, and they realize that their developer buddies would lose money. And um, in closing, I would just ask you, uh, please don't vote for Diane Sachs, because she supports the violent encampment evictions, which harmed me personally and so many of my friends. Th th thanks, Adam. Thank you. Um, uh, Peter. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me here. It's been a pleasure. And I'm going to be asking for your vote. And I hope you vote for Peter Lovering on October 24th. My real goal of this campaign was to just, could somebody have a more sensible approach? And that's really what I thought was missing from the entire campaign and all the people running was a sensible approach. 
And that is what I offer, a cleaner, safer, more efficient city. And that's my goal, and my goal is to do that in the first year. And I hope you vote for me on the 24th. If you voted already, thank you for voting, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Peter. Axel? Uh, thank you all for being here. I hope I shake your hand at the at the end, uh, at the at, at the back uh, before you guys leave. Um, you heard us all shower you with promises and boast about who nominates us. Um, I ask you that you look beyond that and uh, look at take a look at each one of us with a microscope, and that you're able to look through the fancy political speeches and the big campaign budgets and the massive amounts of propaganda and flyers that I'm sure you've received at your doors. Um, talk is very cheap, uh, and I hope you judge each one of us by the content of our character and our ability to do the job. And when you do cast your vote, you vote for me and give me the opportunity to work for you and with you as your next city councilor. Th thank you, Axel. Pierre? Thank you for having me and listening to my ideas. My goal here is to, is to spread my idea about controlling climate change. The, uh, I'm, I recognized an opportunity last fall that there will be a municipal election here followed by a liberal leadership campaign election. So my plan is to, is to try my ideas out for climate change and a few other ideas to eliminate homelessness and then bring these ideas to the provincial legislature. So th that's my goal and that's what I'm here for. I'm trying to learn, what I wanna do is learn politics at the committee level here in Ward 11 because I think this is the center of our society. And then I intend to move up to the provincial legislature where I can challenge the overlord. <laughs> Doug Ford can be stopped. Thank you, Pierre. Robin? Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, we've talked a lot about some really big city ideas, but I do want to stress the importance of the local approach to municipal politics. This is where um, you have the most direct access. It's where people come together to think about and dream about the city that they want, and we can actually work together to do that. It's what I love about municipal politics. It's the personal interactions. I'm so grateful to organizations like the ABCRA that really help strengthen our democracy and bring people together to say, what do we want and how can we work together? I do believe that the experience that I have is going to be critical, and so I hope I've earned your support tonight. If you have any questions, I can be reached at voterbp.ca, or obviously come say hi to me at the end of this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everyone, for this great exchange of ideas that we had tonight. Thank you for coming out. Um, this is not a single issue job. Residents in the area represented by the ABCRA and GYRA need a counselor who will be able to build consensus and organize around shared causes to enrich our communities. I was an early deputant and supporter of the noise bylaw, and I'm very passionate about this issue. Let me work with you, and we'll work on noise. I believe better is possible. We can fix the housing crisis, and we can address affordability. We need city services that actually work. We need to help residents embrace a greener future, and I'd love to look at a Ward 11 specific tree canopy plan. I have the full support and endorsement of Councillor Layden, which will ensure my team is ready to go from day one and advance your priorities without delay and get the answers we are demanding and the results we're demanding from City Hall. I hope I can count on your support on election day so we can get to work as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Norm. And yeah, so again, my name's Andrew Lehman. I wanna thank everyone for showing up today. I wanna just leave you with a thought. You wouldn't vote for, and I think this came from Axel, I'm gonna steal this, these wise words from you. Um, so you wouldn't vote for a prime minister who doesn't live in your country, a premier who doesn't live in your province, a mayor who doesn't live in your city. Why then vote for a city councillor who doesn't live in your ward? My campaign this whole time has been a true grassroots movement. On average, it costs fifty to $70,000 to run a municipal election. My plan is to prove that your everyday layman, your everyday Torontonian, has a real shot at breaking into politics to make real change. Let's have some common sense solutions to everyday big problems, and let's again engage in real, difficult conversations so we can find solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. I, I'm offering myself for public service because I have grandchildren. 
I'd have a much easier life if I, and make a lot more money if I stayed home and just kept on practicing law. But there's important things to do. And there's a real opportunity at city council to make things happen, which there clearly isn't at the provincial level these days. So I think if you actually do a fair comparison of our, of our backgrounds, of our characters, of our um, local roots and experience, I think you'll find that I stand out in terms of my qualifications and the experience that I can bring to City Hall to be a powerful voice for you there and to be really focused on what is in the common interest of us all. It's um, a pleasure and an honor to, to serve you. It's been a pleasure and an honor to grapple with the really difficult questions that you bring forward. There aren't simplistic answers to any of these problems. I won't make promises I can't keep. I'm relentlessly focused on what we could actually deliver. That's what I've done my whole life. Thank That's what I'll do for you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to add that um, I think we should collectively express our appreciation. We have eight, uh, you know, citizens of of our city who have come forward and uh, offered themselves. So that's tremendous, and you're all great candidates. So thank you. Like. I'd like to thank our, our co-hosts, uh, Paul Bedford and Jaira. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. Please stay. We have a lot of treats. I'd like to thank Ian and uh, our board and Catherine, who's put together this entire meeting. And then I'd like to remind everyone there's this great handout. It's called The Secondary Planet, but it should be a primary interest. Please take a copy of that. Please go to our website. Sign up for the newsletter. It's a great newsletter. And special sh shout out to Barb, who is our um, who essentially looks after our online presence and uh, have a great evening and we'll see election day. <laughs>